Greetings, uh, Hamburger Kids. Today uh, is uh, the second part of our mini series uh, talking and discussing Ukrainian economy. Uh, in the previous part, uh, we had a very nice discussion uh, about uh, the Institute, uh, IER, which uh, I have second member today here with me. Uh, nice to have you here, Irina. Thank you. And uh, the last time we were talking about your institute and uh, the general, let's say, uh, business environment during the uh, the main phase of the war and how Ukrainian businesses businesses are coping with the situation. Uh, today, we would like to talk more about uh, infrastructure, especially uh, about uh, electricity, gas and transport. You know, maybe the, the very first uh, question, because the, the the hottest topic in the past uh, months regarding uh, Ukrainian economy infrastructure was the, the electricity supply because of the uh, wave of attacks on the on the power plants and uh, the transmission stations. What's the situation now? Can I just give a short overview before I, sure, I go sure, to, sure, to sure. the current situation? So I have a couple of, of points that I wanted to make. First is that the Ukrainian energy system is severely damaged. Like we had uh, 271 hits during the last uh, heating period. It's a lot. We had the 75% of our heat power plants damaged. The task for the Ukrainian government during this period is to try to repair all of that and try to bring it up to uh, like full capacity. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not doable to bring it to hundred to restore as much as we can. So right now, the Ukrainian energy system is in its repair and maintenance mode. Like we we see the um, uh, power blocks of, of nuclear power plants switching on and off because they they go to repair and they 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 come back from repair. So the the energy generated in in, in Ukraine, it's a, sometimes we have deficit, and the the government warns the citizens to try to consume less in the evenings where there is a peak of uh, electricity consumption, and uh, it warns that with uh, continuing attacks of Russia on uh, in infrastructure and continuing repairs, that there may be power shortages even during the the summertime. Next, another task for the for the government right now is to try to protect uh, the power plants uh, with some kind of, I don't know, concrete walls or something. Not much information about that for obvious security reasons, but the government says that they are doing and the, the job is uh, on schedule. And the third task is to, to replenish the storages. And here we're talking about uh, coal storages and uh, uh, gas storages, oil storages. So right now we have um, the latest figures is that Ukraine has uh, one and a half million tons of coal. And the goal is to have at least 1.8 million tons. So we are nearly there. And uh, as for gas, uh, Ukraine has in storages 11.7 billion cubic meters, and the goal is to have 14.7 billion cubic meters. And here again, the government says that we are on track, that this goal will be achieved. But the biggest problem right now with the electricity is that there are no reserves because the, the infrastructure is so much damaged that if anything like big happens, uh, we won't have any um, any leeway, any any free capacity to to, to use. Yeah. So you were talking mainly about the fuel for power plants, right? Uh, if we're talking about coal, yes, that's for power plants. If we're talking about uh, gas, it's both for consumption by power plants and consumption by industry and uh, households. Currently, are there any outages of electricity in the country or it's stable for now? 
Right now, no, we don't have any outages, uh, but we do have warnings from the government to try to decrease consumption in the evening. And as far as I understand, that uh, deficit is covered by electricity imports. Are people complying with these uh, requests uh, to lower the consumption or is it working? Uh, it's uh, like yes and no. Uh, like the, the the numbers say that uh, some days the consumption decreases, but in some days it doesn't. But of course, it's also dependent not on the compliance by the population, but also on the weather. If we have like uh, higher temperatures outside, even if the the population might try to consume less, uh, it's. Uh, uh, it means that the ACs are working, the conditioners are working, so the, the consumption increases. Okay, let's let's move to the question of gas, which is partly also a question for the power because it's used in uh, gas power plants, but also for the for the winter and for industrial processes. Uh, who, who is currently the main supplier of gas to Ukraine? Like yes, uh, that's a good question because before the war, the biggest supplier was Russia and Belarus. Uh, and uh, right now we bring gas from uh, from Romania, from Bulgaria, Poland, uh, uh, so uh, other neighboring countries. Uh, and I I don't know if this is like uh, non-Russian gas. It may be that we just changed the <laughs> the intermediary, but the actual the producer of gas may still be the same. And of course, there is a small portion of gas that Ukraine produces itself. We have a, a Ukrainian gas, state gas company, Ukrgaz Vodobvanya, and it, the, the company says that it increases, it's increasing its production of gas and it has the plans to increase even more. It's a small portion, but... but as far as I know, but there are theoretically quite a big supplies uh, of natural gas in Ukraine. Is it possible to develop them in the in the near future? Out of uh, out of the volume that Ukraine consumed, uh, it produced, I would say, around the six to seventy percent of that. So it's not like one hundred percent of gas Ukraine imports. So the the fraction of imports wasn't that big. And uh, Ukraine can cover it by imports. If whether whether we can produce all of the gas we need, we we should look at both the consumption side and the supply side. So we are both right now increasing our production and unfortunately decreasing our consumption because of the destruction of uh, Ukrainian industry and uh, decrease in the population. I was maybe more talking about uh, in upcoming years, if it's possible to explore more gas fields and maybe open a new gas wells, uh, because I, I believe there is some potential for uh, new new gas production in the country, but obviously you would need a, quite a lot of capital for this. Maybe, maybe are there already some investors potentially looking into uh, extraction of the natural resources in the upcoming years? Yes, the potential is definitely there, but the problem is that uh, those potential new gas fields are close to the uh, fighting lines. They are in the east of Ukraine and they are in the Black Sea. So right now, of course, there, there can be no talks about uh, gas exploration in the Black Sea because Russia allowed that. And as for... It, it, it depends on where that particular territory is. Right now, what the Ukrainian companies are focusing on is to developing old fields and try to extract as much as possible from them. Uh, we hear in news uh, that uh, the fields that were deemed uh, with low potential are reopened and new technologies are used and they are somehow uh, extracting more gas than before. And also the Ukrainian companies are digging deeper. Like the latest news were that the Ukrhaz Vodobovania opened a new well, uh, which was uh, 6,600 meters deep. It's the deepest well for this company. Okay, and what about the third fuel we uh, did not mention? It's oil. I know that quite a few refineries were uh, hit and potentially destroyed. Uh, what's the situation uh, with uh, with fuels in the country? Yes, with oil, the, like, 
this is the, the biggest problem is that Ukraine no longer produces its own oil. Uh, the two big refineries it had were damaged and they are not operating. Uh, even before the war, around 90% of oil was imported. So that is, that is a problem right now. But uh, uh, the, the numbers say that actually the consumption of oil and the fuels in Ukraine are at the pre-war levels. So all that volume that Ukraine consumed before the war, Ukraine continues to consume and it managed to import all of that volume. If you go now to a petrol station in Kyiv or maybe even closer to the front, there's no problem to buy fuel for an ordinary citizen. In Kyiv, definitely no problem because I am right now in Kyiv. I don't see any lines on the uh, fueling stations uh, and I don't see in the news uh, any like news that there are problems uh, on the east. So I guess uh, the, the situation is, is, uh, is stable there. Uh, the slight, uh, slight issue might be that uh, in July, the Ukrainian government returned the excise tax on fuels. It, uh, uh, it abolished this tax uh, for, for the wartime. So there was no tax for about a year. And right now it, uh, it put it back because uh, the budget needs money. And uh, that, might, they, that, needs, that means that the price of fuel increased in Ukraine slightly. But as for the actual supply of fuel on the fueling stations, there is no shortage. So we already touched the, touched the transport. So let's talk a bit about uh, transportation. We know the situation uh, with, the, with the Black Sea ports that they are generally not operating. What about connection to Danube? I, I remember that a few months ago that Ukraine uh, broadened uh, some canal to the Danube Delta, if I remember correctly. Is it used? Is, is it a good uh, connection or it's just like something very small? Yes, it is used. It's the canal uh, in Ukrainian, it's Bystre. Uh, this canal, uh, it's a, an alternative canal to the Romanian uh, canal Sulina. Uh, it's definitely used and Ukraine not only just reopened it, it's deepened. So it, it uh, dug out, like it increased the depths, which allowed uh, bigger ships to come. Uh, but uh, the, Dan the Danube ports cannot replace the seaports of Ukraine. Uh, the capacity is not comparable at all. And uh, after the after Russia exited the grain initiative, it started uh, shelling those uh, Danube ports as well. And recent news are that uh, actually the uh, ships are afraid to enter those ports because uh, uh, the port Reni, which is on the Danube River, was also shelled recently. And uh, the ships there were like, uh, under danger of, because there was a fire in the port. So the, the, ship, the ship owners are afraid that that fire can catch their ships. And uh, the Danube ports are also one of the major ports for fuel uh, imports. So you can imagine what will happen if the rocket hits the uh, the port with a fuel tanker in, in it. So um, that's why there is like this indirect uh, effect on the on the Danube ports, even though they are not they were not part of that uh, big uh, uh, grain trade under the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Uh, they they were an alternative route and they are also under fire right now. Yeah, I remember it's, it's the is the port which is very close to the Romanian border, right? Exactly. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's, it's uh, the problem is also with the insurance about the uh, with the ships that uh, if if you get uh, hit or or damaged by a war hostility that the insurance doesn't pay you, so that's probably very uh, very scary for the ship owners to go into into such zone. Uh, ships are definitely a problem. Uh, what about rail? Rail, I suppose, uh, except the problem of capacity, obviously, is is probably now the main main road for goods uh, in and out of Ukraine. A rain and roads. Uh, rail. Uh, rail is one of the major uh, modes of transport 
transportation for grain right now. Everybody knows what's, what to do, and the, the grain is kind of a uh, uh, tradable commodity, which is kind of easy to handle. Uh, other, other goods, uh, like imports of electronics, for example, they, of course, they, they don't use rail, they mostly use roads, and they, the imports is done uh, by trucks. About rail, I can say that the biggest obstacle here is the different uh, rail gauge in Ukraine and uh, in neighboring countries. So this means that the train has to stop to reload its goods or to change the, um, the wheels, basically, and then it can uh, continue its, uh, uh, its route. So it, it creates delays and it creates uh, lines at the border. And of course, it's much more difficult to increase the capacity of a railway station because for that you will need to build additional tracks, you will need additional locomotives um, and the wagons. So it's it's cost more costly than just to build a, a new road. I remember there were some maybe only theoretical talks about building a uh, European gauge railway uh, in Ukraine, at least in some part. Is it, is it something like this considered to technically change at least part of the uh, railway network or in this state it's, uh, it's not, uh, not really an option for the upcoming months or years? For the upcoming months, no. Uh, but for the upcoming years, the, pro the projects are there. There are plans like that. And uh, recently I saw the, uh, the plan from, um, uh, I think it was commissioned by the, uh, the European Commission on how to develop the, uh, the railway system and where to build in Ukraine the European uh, railway gauge a network. So for the first uh, cities to be connected are also, of course, those that are closer to the border, uh, like Lviv or Chernivtsi or Urgharad. And then the major goal is to connect Kyiv. So this, this connection of uh, uh, European border Lviv and Kyiv, this is one of the main routes that are in project, in project right now. And also I should mention that the there are routes of Ukrainian, like railway routes going into European countries. And those are also uh, used uh, quite extensively right now. For example, we have a broad gauge connection to Kosice, or we have a connection to some Polish cities. Everything, everything that cannot be used in this way is uh, obviously used. Yeah, yeah, we, we have one big uh, uh, changing station for, for the goods in Chirna Natiso, which is near Košice, which was uh, a sleepy hollow and currently invigorated, re, re, refreshed by the, by the inflow of, uh, of trains uh, from Ukraine, but definitely it has its, uh, its limits. And uh, what about maybe border crossings? I, I guess it, it has been problem and still is problem in terms of waiting times and the, the duty and customs uh, bureaucracy. H has it improved? It did improve. First, uh, some new border crossing points were open. They started not full capacity. They only uh, allowed to pass like empty trucks. To, to speed up the process, but it's still, it's a, it's a big uh, improvement on other border crossing points because it actually extracts those empty trucks from the general line. And uh, like gradually they are brought to full capacity by allowing uh, loaded trucks to pass and then uh, the trucks that uh, bring um, fuels and other uh, dangerous goods as well. And this is one way. And another way is that the Ukrainian government introduced a electronic uh, line. It's a system. It's in Ukrainian. It's called Icherha, e line. Uh, if we translate it into English, it's an electronic system where the drivers can register and can specify what uh, border crossing point they want to cross. They put their uh, vehicle number and they put the, the good that they are uh, bringing. 
And then they, they are given an approximate time where they can come and cross the border. So uh, the, the system was made operational on all 16 border crossing points a couple of months ago. So right now it's, a, it's in a, not, it's, it's not already in a testing mode, but still it needs some time to, to stabilize, you know, that uh, everybody learns how to use it. And uh, we know how many, how many drivers and trucks we have. So right now, as far as I can see from the driver chats that, I, that I'm reading, uh, the drivers are in favor of it. And they say that it helps them. Not, it doesn't help to reduce the, the line, obviously, but it helps to make their life easier because they can predict when they should go to the border and it helps them to plan their activities. The drivers from the European Union, are they not afraid to come to Ukraine? Are there still uh, European trucks coming to Ukraine or is mainly all in the hands of Ukrainian drivers and Ukrainian trucks? No, European drivers are coming. Uh, if we just look at the this uh, information system, the first uh, version was in Ukrainian, but then there were a lot of complaints that Polish drivers, uh, they also need to use the system. So there was a version made in Polish. And now we have three more versions in Hungarian, in uh, uh, Romanian, I guess, and then um, I forgot the, the third language, but it, it obviously shows that not just Ukrainians use the system and not just Ukrainians are crossing the border. Very good. So hopefully the next language is Slovak. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, hopefully, yeah. And uh, maybe a question like, oh, I know that currently there are no flights except military missions, but uh, is there any talk about renewing f at least some kind of cargo flights, for example, to the Ujhorod airport, which is very close to the Slovak border and probably should be reasonably safe? There, there are talks, there are always talks and hopes that at least one of the airports can resume its operation. And uh, actually the, the port that is mentioned is not the Ujharad, but Lviv, because it's bigger and has bigger capacity. But there are also con immediate concerns that once Ukraine announces that okay, Lviv, port, Lviv airport is operational, the next rocket will be uh, will be there. So it's it's really dangerous. With Urgarat Airport, it's uh, well Urgarat Airport even before the war had its own issues with uh, crossing the Slovak air uh, airspace and uh, the need to get this uh, um, intergovernmental agreements on how to use that airspace. And also, it wasn't it's. It's a small airport with um, small capacity, and uh, its uh, runway is not uh, uh, up to standard. So it will need uh, some works to be done before it can be opened. Right now, I don't see any talks uh, like in the expert circles about Ushgarat Airport. These are pretty tough times regarding transport and, and infrastructure. But also, um, it's just quite astonishing resilience. For example, when we take the, the electricity uh, network that it was really targeted to be destroyed and knocked out and it still works. So uh, do you think if the, if the war goes on for, let's say, one, two years more, that uh, the infrastructure can hold together? Uh, I think yes, because... As the war goes on, we learn. We learn how to protect. We learn how to, to react quickly. And we learn how to be flexible. If we are talking about the energy infrastructure, the biggest issue of Ukrainian energy system is that it relies on big power plants that supply a lot of electricity through high voltage uh, lines. So it's all, it's all done in big, big volumes. So if a rocket hits one uh, big power plant, then it's a big impact on the on the whole system. So what we have to do now is try to decentralize it and to, to build a lot of small power plants, which can supply a small village or even like a couple of buildings. 
and that way Ukraine will be less reliant on these uh, big, uh, big uh, Soviet style uh, power plants. So I'm quite optimistic that the Ukrainian infrastructure will hold. Of course, uh, we, we will need any help we can get. And we are very grateful for, for the help that is coming from our partners and our neighbors, especially in the electricity sector, because uh, as you know, the, that equipment is uh, it's huge and it costs a lot of money and it's, it needs a lot of time to produce. So uh, the help that we got last winter when uh, the power units uh, were searched on, all our neighbors and uh, this the like transmission units were uh, supplied to Ukraine as um, with with that help and with uh, ingenuity and with adaptability of uh, of the system, I think we we can manage. Is there an initiative also from the bottom? I mean, can you see? people or companies uh, building photovoltaics or buying batteries or creating their own sources of, of electricity? Definitely, that's what we saw last winter. Uh, the first reaction was to buy uh, diesel generators because they, they, they are smaller and they are easier to, to, to bring and to, uh, to buy fuel for them. But uh, bigger companies are planning and constructing their own um, power supply units. Uh, some of them use uh, uh, gas, some of them use uh, solar power or biofuel. Uh, it, it depends on the um, what kind of industry it is and where it is situa situated. So what kind of uh, fuel is available? So yeah, we do see those kind of projects all over the country, yes. So definitely the at least in terms of electricity, the infrastructure will emerge uh, sooner or later, uh, much more decentralized and much more anti-fragile and, uh, and stronger. Yeah. Irina, it was great talking to you. Hope uh, you have a nice day and I hope we will uh, talk and meet in the future and we'll discuss the, the reconstruction and, and the growth in, uh, in your country. And I'm also looking forward for the, for the next part with your, uh, with your colleague. Uh, talking about Ukrainian economy. And for now, again, we are very happy to have you here and see you soon. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and it was nice talking to you as well, Martin. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.